Yeah! It is but me, the YouTube leftist, here for what else but to ruthlessly declare everything you once loved as toxic, cancelled, to expose the receipts. And what, O oh fates, do you decree for the carnival of pain today? <laughs> I love Friends. Binge watching it with my mum since back when I was probably way too young to understand most of it, it was a show that consistently felt genuine, unforced, that truly captured that feeling of flipping on an episode and feeling like you were catching up with some old pals. Characters were presented in such a way that they grew naturally while always feeling familiar. Rachel evolved from a jaded, prissy socialite to a capable businesswoman, Chandler from a nervous, depressed wreck to a responsible family man, Joey from a womanizing scamp to a borderline child incapable of functioning Ready? as an adult. Go. You put this in your coffee. Uh, a spoon. Your hands. Your face. <laughs> it's white. Paper. Snow. A ghost. <laughs> Okay, they're not all super positive, but any jumped sharks the show went through were fairly subtle and minor. Except for the Joey and Rachel thing. For the most part, it was with a deft touch that the show managed to build on its characters and their world while always grounding it in something comforting, something nice and warm. It was for me, sitting around the living room after school or on the weekend, the epitome of what a straightforward sitcom could achieve. Fortunately for me, when I watched it, I wasn't any kind of marginalized group. Okay, don't worry, I'm totally okay with the gay thing. <laughs> what gay thing? Uh, just, you know, in general, the whole pe people being gay thing. So what's new? Still, uh, well? <laughs> you never know. <laughs> this was Carol's favorite beer. <laughs> she always drank it out of the can, I mean, I should've known. Hey, when did you and Susan meet Huey Lewis? Uh, that's our friend Tanya. <laughs> You know, my parents split up, it was because of that guy. Whenever I would see him, I would always think, you know, you're the reason. You are why they're not together. And it didn't matter how nice he was, or, you know, how happy he made my dad. <laughs> are you gay? Yes! It's okay, I get that a lot doing what I do. But hey, I'm straight. Dear, you're just like a guy who's an Annie. <laughs> That's right? That's right. Don't you play a woman? A woman in a man's body. Much better. Did someone take an order? Uh, oh yeah, uh, she did. Uh, he did. She? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm new. I'm... Hello, Charles. And there's Daddy. <laughs> Nora. Charles. I'll turn the little to be wearing a dress like that. Did you have a little too much penis to be wearing a dress like that? Some girl ate Monica. <laughs> It was after hearing the recent news that Friends' full 10 season run would be unjustly torn from the arms of Netflix that I decided to check out the old show. <coughs> A fun early childhood nostalgia trip, which obviously this guy right here was desperately in need of. Yet, as I watched it, well, I noticed a cut on my hand. Nothing too large, not even really bleeding, just a cut. And yet, as I went on watching Friends, that cut started to itch. It started to itch real bad. It got so unbearable that I just couldn't help scratch at the scab every time it started to form around the wound, exposing the gash over and over and over. <coughs> An unbearable pain, and each time the scab grew and grew. And that pain's name? Being problematic. You know, my brother and his boyfriend have been trying to adopt for three years. What agency did you two go through? <laughs> And not in the same way I've looked at older stuff in the past, not in the, well, I don't know, we'd quite approach that issue like that nowadays way. The show was kind of outright malicious on so many occasions. Man, if you want to be gay, be gay. <laughs> Actually, let me back that up. I don't think the show was outwardly malicious. I don't think its creators intended any kind of hatefulness. To the contrary, the feeling I had watching the show 
The reason it was so beloved in the first place, of warmth and inclusion and familiarity, I think that's what they were going for. In fact, it's the mission statement of the very first episode, to be accepted for who you on, want Daddy, to be. To it's like all of my life, everyone has always told me, you're a shoe! You're a shoe, you're a shoe, you're a shoe! And then today I just stopped and I said, what if I don't want to be a shoe? What if I want to be a, a purse? You know, or, 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 or a hat? No, I don't want you to buy me a hat, I'm saying that I am a hat. It's a metaphor, Daddy! And especially in the early seasons, Friends' bread and butter is that mystical ingredient, relatability. Before you had enough of a familiarity with the characters that the true depth of their strangeness could really be explored, <laughs> what the show often fell back to was simple observations and character moments that were easy to relate to your own experiences. Again, even looking at just that first episode, we have Chandler's funny anecdote about a weird Freudian dream he had. You have Ross struggling to put together some IKEA furniture. We've all been there. And even that awkward moment when someone in your friend group makes the conversation just a little 14. too heavy. My mom had just killed herself and my stepdad was back in prison. And I got here and I didn't know anybody. This, I believe, is how such a fairly generic premise managed to take off to be so wildly successful. These were characters written in such a primordially gettable way that it filled multiple decades with water cooler chat about which friend are you? I used to be a Chandler. Now I'm a Phoebe. We all saw ourselves in the characters, because that was the goal. For the most part, the only goal. Friends rarely challenged, well, anything. By design, because by doing so, they would be in effect challenging their audience. LGBT people might be acknowledged, but only if it's either just a straight up throwaway gay joke or Carol and Susan, the most sterile possible gay couple. Incidentally, both played by straight women, and Susan played incredibly unsympathetically until well into the show's run. The HIV epidemic might come up, as an extended joke about how Joey did an awareness campaign and now people are laughing at him because they think he has an STI, which is maybe a bit insensitive considering what was going on at the time. And if you wanted to see how the show handled transgender people... Well... Hi. Dad. <laughs> but this is falling into the trap of, again, blaming Friends simply for being a show of its time, eh? But the issues with Friends aren't just judging the show by today's standards. What I want to illustrate is that Friends was kind of this way by design, and what that might actually say about how we consume media today. What I'm trying to get at here is that Friends wasn't being subversive or politically incorrect here. In fact, for its time, Friends was the definition of politically correct. And that's the point. So to wrap it all around, no, I don't think Friends was outwardly malicious in its presentation. But always something was bubbling under the surface. And I'd like to have a go at exposing it. Oh, Friends being a tricky show to go back to has surprisingly little to do with us maybe going into it expecting more than it could have pushed on. It's not like it's the start of a conversation we've already reached the end of. The thing about Friends was, by design, it really wasn't aspiring for some goal beyond being what it was at that moment. Friends wants you to feel comforted and connected to its characters, for its own sake. Just for the joy of knowing them. In fact, I can say I know this definitively, as co-creator Marta Kaufman said in reflection on the series, I think for me, personally the greatest thing of it, is that people still get joy from it. It makes them happy, it makes them smile, it makes them laugh, it makes them care. This is all great. Though the question is, care to the end of caring about any particular social issue, event, or perspective? Not really, just care. So the friends are not crafted to challenge any particular experience or perspective, merely to reflect back on the audience of straight white middle class Americans. And so the politics of Friends are, in perfect encapsulation, the politics of the mid-90s. It's not just the fact that despite living in the middle of New York, the show doesn't really do much with the diaspora. Black characters are a rarity, and other minorities even more so. Joey spends most of the show working in theatre, yet we don't get a single gay pal. 
More to the point, being gay is, as we've looked at here in the past and on other much better channels, primarily just a punchline. To be transgender is to be treated as a freak. To be a minority is to be largely ignored outside of the most token of roles. And to be mentally ill? See you guys. Bye. Ridiculously dull, Bobby. <laughs> and from the lens of class, there's a lot many people have said about Friends. In an effort to maintain its relatability among poor and rich alike, the Friends always sort of float somewhere between comfortable and just getting by. Of course, all of this within the framework of a bunch of people in their late 20s living in massive apartments in the middle of Manhattan on, uh, okay incomes. None particularly overworked. They just hang out chatting at Monica's a lot. I mean, somehow Phoebe manages to live the affluent Manhattan life and she's consistently played off as the poor one. And there too, status quo is never challenged for fear of disrupting that general relatable feeling, even if future years have only made the aspirational fantasy of their lifestyles all the more obvious. And yeah, I know the show waves it all away with rent control, an attempt to fill in the plot hole, but hey, at least they got friends to actually comment on a legitimate systemic problem to, to flick a plot hole. Nice. Victory for the left, everybody. How they made rent on Monica's apartment during that time it was literally just Rachel working as a waitress, even with rent control, we'll just leave that. I do also have to give kudos for this scene, which always struck me as a kid as strangely raw, in which the then poor Rachel, Joey and Phoebe are forced to confront Monica, Chandler and the largest friend to the reality that, well, they don't exist in the same space in terms of class. They don't make as much money. And you can see the discomfort in the characters even beginning to deal with a conflict like this. And deep underneath, you can kind of feel the discomfort of the crew and the audience too. Because this was not what Friends was there to do. It didn't really have issue episodes. It was simply another day to hang out with your pals. Oh, sorry. There's also this subversive look at racial caricature in which Joey is rehearsing for the role of a young thug and the show is very self-critical in the way it handles Take whatever you want, just please don't hurt me. <laughs> Marvel at this biting social commentary of Joey losing his health insurance and then developing a significant medical problem, a crisis which devastates the lives of thousands of Americans every year. Solved because... Like, a day later, he gets his insurance back, and I guess they don't have a pre-existing conditions clause. So why does it matter if friends tackle social or political issues, and why does that make it hard to return to? People loved the show then, they loved it now. I'm actually in both of those groups. So why do I find it hard to get back into? Well, I think the lack of any real attempt at a critical or subversive edge is really what makes it feel increasingly dated. The characters always exist in the way that audience in that moment would expect them to, but nothing trying to push a boundary or even highlights that that boundary exists. The show sits comfortably in its box, and any real adult topic beyond what can be made relatable and funny or relatable and heartwarming in a straightforward way, there's no place for it here. When the friends act shitty to marginalized groups, when the show makes fun of overweight people or mentally ill people or different races or sexualities or really being anything but an attractive straight white cis person, it's always in just such a way that the audience is comfortable with it. To meet you. <laughs> so are you his mother or his father? <laughs> I didn't even have a chance to act as though I'm okay with it. <laughs> They're laughing totally with it. Hello. Even something like Monica's toxic relationship with her parents just kind of resets without critical examination, even after the rare occasions that the show confronts it beyond relatability. Now I have a counterexample here, one which has in many ways served as the true successor to Friends, yet one which is also reactive to it. One which does attempt something beyond connection for connection's sake, which draws in while remaining subversive. One which, despite arguably being far more offensive on a surface level, I believe has a much greater chance of standing the test of time. It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia began one year after Friends ended, and at current 144 episodes deep against Friends' 230. 
It has the same basic structure, a sitcom using oft-repeated sets with a familiar cast of late 20s, early 30s characters getting into various hijinks. Only It's Always Sunny doesn't just want you to see these people as mirrors. Chandler was avoidant and sarcastic, but still a fairly normal dude. Monica, an obsessive neurotic, but still a fairly normal lady. That was the point. Mac, Dennis, Dee, Charlie, Frank... These arseholes are something boy, else. Don't worry about it. I laced it with sleeping pills. He's gonna be out like a light in two minutes. Yeah, that is some diabolical shit, dude. It's Always Sunny wants you to maintain a critical eye. It wants you to judge these people. Because while the friends will be shitty just acceptably enough to maintain the status quo, the Paddy's crew will deliberately go way beyond that line, and in the process force you to consider where that line is, and in that way, give the show the necessary self-critical space that Friends does not. Where Joey is just a regular old womanizer for 10 years straight, It's Always Sunny gives us the Dennis system. Separate entirely. And case in point, Season 1, Episode 1, The Gang Gets Yo, Racist. Charles. What? Guys, this is Terrell from my acting class. Even from its first episode, there is a distinct sense that with It's Always Sunny, it was always very much the intention to offer an unfiltered look at the lives and perspectives of these misfits. And in this way, when race is a factor in the episode, this is actually something the show is going to confront beyond a throwaway punchline. It's not just that Dee brings over a black guy she's interested in and the gang is mildly uncomfortable with him and that's the joke. It's a full episode in which they go through the motions of first being more comfortable with him, then seeing black people as a viable demographic for their bar, comedy at the expense of their very obvious biases and preconceptions, their clumsy attempts to connect, to bust that shit up, boy. Absolutely. and culminating in their comeuppance about viewing this group of people as nothing but a potential revenue source when another demographic winds up being the one pulled in by their new friend. What are you doing, man? I'm not... You have the most beautiful eyes. Okay, man, but I'm... Really? Admittedly, there's plenty that can be played off as a little sloppy here, with the extent to which gay people get entirely caricatured and the fact that most of these biases remain fairly unresolved, but that's in part the point. While both It's Always Sunny and Friends will maintain the standard sitcom reset, It's Always Sunny will not just skirt by a contentious topic of the day. The next episode deals directly with not only abortion rights, but the aesthetic of being pro or anti-choice. Are you actually going to throw away all your convictions for a chance to get laid? I don't really have any convictions. A stark comparison to Friends, wherein there's multiple separate occasions these career-driven 20-somethings wind up getting pregnant, and to the best of my knowledge, the topic isn't broached once. Could be wrong there, but... Hey, did I mention the 230 episodes? And around this time, you even had popular shows like Degrassi, Scrubs, Sex in the City openly discussing this stuff. With all due respect, this is none of your business. Or Jesus's. I believe he would beg to differ. In the case of It's Always Sunny, there's also no fear in reapproaching a topic they were getting a bit behind on. Mac's underlying homophobia was revealed as a straight-up cover for the fact that he was gay, with a recent coming out episode last year. Well, I'm gay. Yeah. No shit. Not to say the trope of a homophobe turning out to be gay is particularly revolutionary, not to say this topic can only be dealt with by just making the guy gay, but it still shows the desire to push beyond a somewhat tired decade-long gay joke. Compare and contrast to the weird Joey and Chandler are scared to hug in case people think they're gay thing, which just kind of kept going, unexamined. Don't you have a wife and kids by now? This all comes down to the point. Shows like It's Always Sunny, Scrubs, and all the rest, while surely having those that's not how they play it nowadays things, because as I said earlier, these conversations are going to evolve, are not just interested in being at best reactive to the past, as was the case with Friends. These were shows that wanted to be proactive, to make statements or observations about how we could approach current problems and how that could impact the future. Again, I love Friends. Again, the show isn't cancelled just because I'm re-examining it now. I mean, it's literally already cancelled. My SJW powers can only go so far. But I think the way the show uncritically perpetuated a lot of things that really seem kind of backwards now, I think that's demonstrative of the dangers of handling a show the way this program was. 
to create a show on the premise of simply connecting with its leads. Not to make any real points, but just as a mirror to the audience, a million dollar cultural feedback loop. To have such a pull and do so little with it. To be proactive, not necessarily to tell the audience what to believe, but to at least acknowledge problems and open a conversation about it, I think that can be quite important. If I'm being honest, I think there's a lot of consumable entertainment right now built on the premise of just uncritically repeating back what the audience already thinks and feels. And I think some pretty toxic communities are coming out of it. But that's a bit beyond the scope here. So what should we do about Friends? Well, we can think about the ways it failed certain topics and consider that for the future if we hope to create writing that might help stand the test of time. You can just keep watching it, it's not like it's a satanic object. Or if you have any decency, you'll sign my change.org campaign so we can get this filth off of- Hey there folks, look at that, wasn't that fun? Can't wait to check the comments and read all the ways I completely misrepresented friends because I missed an episode about how poor people are good. This one's a tad shorter just because I was, well, re-watching friends and felt like speaking from the heart. If you agree, if you disagree, please chat about it in the comments below. While you're down there, give us a like, a subscribe, hit the bell button so you know when new videos of mine come out, and please feel free to share this on Reddit, Twitter, or your friendly neighborhood Discord server. Once again, this show can only happen with your support on Patreon. If just a portion of you all donated a dollar a month, that's far more time I get to dedicate to videos, and far more resources to up the production value. There's also coffee for one-time donations. Today I'd like to thank Al Swigart, Alba, Alex Wenberg, Anna Akrasia, Bira Yer, Dill, Holy Mittens, James C, Janet Horver, Jordan Hoxie, Kevin H, Kristen Roars, La Pori Bay, Mia Nakano, Michael Q. Warnock, Nikki Wells, Owen Mateson, Pavel A, Peter Coffin, R. Connolly, Sleepy Slug, Stephanie Bullard, Unnamed Muffin, and Vrysha Jairus, with a huge, huge, huge thanks to Brian, Kane Johnson, Colin Johnson, Evie Rosk, The Tear, and Nick Schwert. And with that, thanks for watching, love you all, and...